Welcome back to another episode of Plastic Weekly. And uh, this this week, I'm joined by someone who I don't see that often, but it just feels like we're, we're friends because you're just such a lovely person. It's Allison Vest. Uh, you might know her as the unbelievably still reigning 2019 Canadian lead champion somehow, uh, the 2020 Canadian Boulder champion, uh, first woman to send V13, uh, and Plastic Weekly's undercover correspondent in Salt Lake City, uh, giving us all the secrets of what's happening at the U.S. Uh, training center. Um, and because you're one of those people that now has your own Wikipedia page, I think we can get to know you a little bit better uh, under the heading personal life. Vest is nicknamed Albatross because of her plus seven ape index. She has garnered a following on social media as a result of her humorous and satirical training videos. In her spare time, she is a youth team coach at the Hive Climbing Gym in Vancouver. Not sure if that's still accurate right now. Uh, her best friend is American climber Kyra Condi. How much do you love having your your friendships documented on the internet? Isn't that cool? I mean, th that's it. Can I like? Do I go now? Like that? We're done. Summed it up. I um, just needed. I just needed the picture. So nice to chat, and yeah. I'll see you later. It's been that great. was it. <laughs> <laughs> so what's it like being being famous? What's the deal? So somebody actually reached out to me and asked um, if she could make the Wikipedia page because she noticed I didn't have it, um, and I I think she I can't remember exactly if she's listening to this. I'm going to get it wrong, but it, she's some sort of scientist and so has access to fact checking like the biology or microbiology pages or something and asked if she could make it. And so, I mean, I was like, heck, heck yeah, you can. Nice. And, uh, and, and then we, uh, she was asking what to put there and I was like, can you just link Kyra's Wikipedia page <laughs> into mine? Like that'd be, that's next level. And, uh, and there you are. I think she. I think if you look at the funniest part is that it's cited. There's like a at the bottom in the <laughs> bibliography. The fact that we're best friends has like an Instagram post as the citation. That's amazing. Which is pretty funny. That's yeah. I like you know when when I was in university, the idea of like using Wikipedia as a source was ridiculous. Um, but now the fact that you can just use Instagram as a source for stuff is even better. I, I know. <laughs> I know. That's uh, so if she's if if the person contributing is watching, um, I'm sure she didn't do this page. But the page for Anna Chaubert currently has a picture of Anna Brozik, uh as as her uh, photo. Oh, so no. if you want a side job to do, uh, there's a lot of terrible climbing info out there. You've done a great job with Allison's page; it's excellent. But uh, maybe um, make a make an edit to the to the Anna Chaubert one. But uh, oh, and yeah, any anyway, it's it's lovely to see you. The last time we we spoke was at uh, was in the start of twenty. 2020 at the Canadian Boulder Championships you just won uh for your second yeah your second time um and a lot a lot has happened you know since January of last year and I figured different. I kind of want to pick up there a couple weeks after well I guess like kind of a, a month two months after your national win you went to the um Olympic Continental Qualifier in LA didn't go the way you wanted to we all know how the story goes from there. The world ended a couple weeks later. Uh, but I, the first question, and it might be a, a short answer, is what was your game plan after uh, coming out of the Olympic qualifier and not getting that Olympic berth? Like, what, what does your future look like staring down that desolate tunnel? Like, what, uh, what, was, what was your outlook at that point of being like, okay, the Olympics are now off the table. What do you want to do? Yeah, so... Uh, focusing on World Cups was definitely top of the list. Mostly the Boulder World Cups are my it's my favorite discipline. Also lead though too. Um, so sort of figuring out how to best train and prepare for that season, um, which actually already did include moving to Salt Lake to live with Kyra in April was going to be the plan. Um, just because she has like a pretty great setup here and. Um, we had been talking about trying to be in the same city for a while, for a long time. So that was going to be the, the option already. It was supposed to be in April was sort of to move here and be training and then have this be the base for a while while I go to world cups and back again was going to be the play. But uh, as we all know, is not how it went. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 2019 was like a, it was a pretty good season for you. I mean, like you had your first semifinal in a Boulder world cup. Um, what was your mindset around your training after having like, you know, some high points 
in the Boulder season, but then the Olympic pathway not going as well as I'm guessing you wanted it to. Um, like going into the 2020 season at the time, uh, were you feeling like optimistic about about your your training situation and about yourself as an athlete? Yeah, you know, last year I when I competed in the first two World Cups that I did that season, the two in China, I had a bit of a nagging finger injury. Um, so I didn't really know like how much of it was me being cautious of that. Cause my, the first two didn't, did not go that well. Um, and then I was able to go home and, and train and make sure I was fully healthy. And then when I went to Vail, I did, as you say, make semifinals. So that was like really exciting and promising for me. But I mean, then after Vail, the, that's the last Boulder world cup of the season. So it's kind of hard to, to tell what, what's going to be different and who's going to have trained better or more or whatever for the next season. But I, I definitely think sort of in 2020, I was feeling as strong as I ever have. So I definitely bouldering wise was optimistic. Um, I think as far as the Olympic qualifier goes, like I, you know, you always go into a competition hopeful, but it would have had to be a perfect storm in order for me to get an Olympic spot at that event. Like I would have had to have the best lead climb of my life and, have a really good bouldering round as well. Like speed was never my discipline and I hadn't been training it for long enough for that to be what makes the difference. So in order for that Olympic spot to happen for me, that would have had to be like a really extraordinarily special event. Um, So I think for that comp, I was mostly just disappointed that I didn't do what I knew I was capable of doing in the bouldering discipline alone. Um, But I, uh, at the same time that, event was really cool because we got to be there and see Alana qualify and uh and have a a full dual gender Canadian contingency at the Olympics is pretty cool as well so um yeah so I mean it was like obviously it's always disappointing like you obviously always hope to have that perfect storm and for that to work out like you know like a bit of a dream but it doesn't happen that often so yeah while it was disappointing it didn't really change my outlook for the world cup season on its own all right so so then like then then the bad thing happened and uh so you mentioned previously that you were planning to come to salt lake city even before um covid uh struck so how did that change your plans it looks like it delayed it i'm guessing at first like what what was life like in the first couple months of uh of just being stuck in stuck in british columbia in your home all shooting tiktoks (laughs) yeah so i mean the shutdown the the silver lining of the shutdown for me was really um i actually left vancouver and i went home to canmore alberta where my parents live okay Um, and i quarantined in their basement for two weeks because i was super nervous about going from a big city to a small town and i didn't want to be like a random asymptomatic super spreader and give the town of Canada all COVID. Um, So I spent the two weeks by myself in the basement. And then after that, I was able to be home and um, hang out with my family for three months. And I hadn't really seen them much just because of competing and traveling so much in what felt like a really long time. Like it'd been um, probably over a year since I'd really been around them. Um, for an extended period of time. And the last time I lived there, my younger brother is seven or eight years younger than me. Um, and the last time I actually lived at home, he was like 13 or something. (laughs) And then when I got to be there in the spring, he's 18 now. So he was like a real person with opinions and a personality. And so it was really cool actually to be able to be around them for a few months and sort of be reacquainted with the family. So while it was sort of disappointing to have this Salt Lake trip be delayed. Um, that was definitely a, a big silver lining. And I mean, you know, something as intense and serious as a pandemic going on, at, at least initially, it was like the last thing on my mind was trying to move to Salt Lake to to be training and living with Kyra. So, right. um, you know, obviously it was difficult and it was difficult for everyone on varying degrees and on varying levels, but... Um, I actually, I felt lucky that it was, that I was also able to be with my family during that time. Yeah. Um, eventually you do get down to Salt Lake and this is kind of what I, what I'm kind of most interested in is, is the, like the lifestyle of training in Salt Lake City with the people that you're training with. Um, I mean, like the Canadian team right now is in a really weird spot because 
you know, the CEC is not running any competitions at all. Uh, so there, there's, you know, no real reason for anybody but like Alana and Sean to really train right now, except for the few people that might be doing World Cups uh, alongside them. But otherwise, like everything's just no locals, no, you know, no nothing. Um, so you're down there in this little hive of like psych, it looks like. And of course, they have a facility that seems to be dedicated just for for the best athletes. They've got, you know, coaching for it. And it the, the, the cool part is it is attracting all of those climbers from wherever they live. They're coming and spending time there, which is always going to be the hardest thing for big countries like the States and Canada. Um, so first thing I want to ask is like, what is the community like there? Like, is it really just yourself and other top tier athletes that are allowed in the building? And what is the, the attitude? What's, you know, it, it seems like the, the energy runs really high in that space. Um, I mean, so the answer to the first question, it is, it's that facility, um, especially because of COVID, I think Mm. uh, for a big part because of COVID right now, it, it is just those select athletes, um, that are allowed in there. And then the Olympians, so Kyra and Nathaniel both get a plus one into the facility. Just, I think the hope there was to, um, help them be motivated to train and keep them going. And, and, you know, they know what they, what is going to motivate them better than anybody else. So, um, so I am Kyra's plus one into that facility currently. Um, which is why I'm allowed in there. So that's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think, I think they have international athlete policies as well, but at the moment that's, uh, that's my in (laughs) to the GC, but, um, TC is training center also for that's what (laughs) that's the lingo. Um, but I mean, yeah, like it, I mean, it's amazing. Like they, their hold room is like the size of some of the gyms in Canada in there. Um, just because, you know, holds are important, especially going into the Olympics. Like I think the pamphlet of holds that they're going to be able to use, like the setting crew is going to be able to use there is massive. So, um, I think it's important for those, those Olympians to be able to climb on the holds that they're going to get at the Olympics. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think it largely just speaks to the, the growth of the sport in general. Like I, having a centralized training center is just what happens. I think when a a sport is developed and has policies and processes and like I worked for judo BC for a couple summers and for judo, for example, in Canada, it's like if you want to be on the national team and you want to be good at judo, like you move to Montreal because that's where the training center is. Um, and I think for a lot of sports, that's just sort of how it goes. When you're a national level athlete, you live at the training center. That's where the coaches are. That's where their facility is. And if you want to sort of make it on the World Cup stage, it's just what you do. So it's pretty cool to see that happening here and to be sort of witness to that process. Um and it's, it is interesting because it's not like it's not like they've mandated anything even yet. Like they're not like you want to be on the national team, you live in Salt Lake, you train here. But it just is what makes sense. Like it's what where the facility is. You know, Josh Larson, the head coach of the national team, has the whole competition side of the wall to do whatever he wants on. So, you know, Cairo will walk in and be like, hey, Josh, like I really struggled with this move on women's three in Myringen in you know, 2016 and he'll recreate that exact boulder on the angle that he wants. So just to have the control of a facility like that is, is really amazing. And I think it's going to make a big difference. Um, and I actually think in terms of Kyra and the Olympics, cause that's my direct comparison at the moment. I actually think her having the ability to have this amount of time to just be training and dedicating it to getting better at comp boulders and getting stronger and doing all those things is really going to, pay off for her. And I'm actually really excited to see what she can do at the Olympics. Cause I think she's stronger than she ever has been. So it's very cool to see that atmosphere develop here. That's awesome. Um, I, uh, I, I think, I think it was Sierra Blair Coyle posted like kind of like a, a, a short vlog of a, a training trip she did there. Um, so if anybody's looking for like a kind of a walkthrough of the facility, uh, you can check out her channel. That's kind of what I'm basing my idea of what the space looks like. But aside from having, you know, all of the, the training equipment that you could ever want, it seems to be broken down into kind of like a, a fill or a spray area. And then that competition zone, which is very sparse and probably everything gets flipped constantly. Um, how much, uh, 
what's 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 the question I'm trying to ask? Like, um, who really has influence over what is set in that area? Like, is it Nathaniel, Kyra, Colin, Brooke, and whatever they need kind of gets built in that space? Do they kind of have like the I guess like veto power, are they the ones that really influence what gets put up there? Or is it a, a little bit more broad for all of the other people that also climb in the gym? It's definitely, it's definitely broader than that for sure. Um, I think it, it's more like, cause Brooke and Colin don't live here, just Nathaniel and Kyra do. So it's more things like if Brooke and Colin are in town, they'll be like more structured mock comps or more specific boulders. Um, but I mean, it's really Josh Larson that has creative control. Like, uh, I mean, I, I personally, I think he is, he's brilliant as a setter, as a coach. Um, I, I really do think he is an unbelievable person to have. You're just cutting out if you can hear me just one sec. role all right so you you were just saying uh you think josh larson is like an excellent person to have in that role can you uh keep going from there yeah so i I do i really i think he does a phenomenal job and um his sort of creativity in terms of root setting is seemingly endless he like every week there'll be a new move or a new concept or something in there so i mean he definitely like i think at one point there was a chalkboard up that said like move requests and so you could like he could have athletes go in and write like like i said like i don't know moscow 2018 and then have like the time stamp of the live stream or the boulder or or whatever if if uh and like anybody any any of the athletes in there could could uh write something down there if they wanted but um for the most part he he just does it he just goes in and sets whatever he wants and it's always really hard but also new and fun and creative yeah that's sick um you you've had like a lot of interesting coaches I, I don't know how far back everything goes like i don't know if you worked with young and canmore uh so he's somebody that you know has been all over the place in the canadian scene and then andrew wilson who's kind of the outgoing um head coach for uh canada jeff thompson who kind of has his career in gymnastics but is also like a long-term climber and uh and then christian core of course as well so like legendary italian uh boulderer you've got a really good like there's there's not that many amazing coaches in climbing in north america yet you've got a pretty like solid streak of of coaches um could you kind of uh I, I i'm interested in, in josh larson as as a coach um could you describe kind of like his 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 attributes and maybe compare them to those other coaches that you've uh, had yeah i mean i think um yeah so young was my first coach from when i was nine or ten to 17 i think um and i i mean i personally think the demeanor of a youth coach versus an adult coach and that process is a lot different um like i think what was really great about young I mean, it was also intense with young cause he would just tell us what, you know, he's like, you are doing this. This is what you're doing on this day. You know, it doesn't matter if it's hard. You're doing, this is how you're, so he was like very authoritative, um, which I think worked really well for a high level competitive team. I mean, he had a lot of really strong athletes in Canada come out of his program. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's sort of what you need as a, from a youth coach is obviously you want to foster a love for climbing, but also you just got to tell them what to do. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily true for a adult coach. Um, like I Ho- feel like hopefully I if you're like, coaching adults, they've kind of like gotten past that point, right. Of needing totally. like strict direction. Even, <laughs> even more in terms of like, like for Kyra, for example, um, she keep talking. Always, I just need to fix my windows being a okay. <laughs> dumb. Keep just keep, I can still hear you. Keep going. She, uh, she has always sort of been self coached. Like, I don't think she's really ever had a coach that she's connected with really strongly. Um, and Josh does a really good job of sort of acknowledging that. And I think they work really well together as a team. You know, he doesn't try to like motor through her pre existing training strategies. Um, and sort of negate what she's done all her life. 
so they sort of create training plans that are what he thinks is best, but also have her training programs woven in. Um, and I, I think for me personally, that's something that the team of me, Jeff and Christian did really well. Like Christian brings such a heavy knowledge of climbing and training and just sort of like the grungy gritty climbing training, which I also really like. Um, like even this year with all everything being closed and locked down, like I, I feel like I've still done a good job of training consistently through it just because that is sort of what mo- has always motivated me is just like the part of training that just kind of sucks. Um, but, um, but I was able to like talk to them and be like, I think I need to do more of this and this is what I want to be doing. And then we were able to have conversations and figure out a program that, um, that worked best. So I feel like when you turn, when you become an open athlete, it's sort of about working with a coach that you can have like a rapport with and work together with, um, and also build a foundation of trust. And I feel like Josh in particular as a coach is really good at that. Like I think all the athletes in there really trust his knowledge and his experience. And they sort of are able to talk to him about how they're feeling about their training or the program or whatever. And he, um, he just does a really good job of having a, a really good relationship with the athletes, but then also, um, I think they all respect the hell out of him and just, um, really believe in what he's doing in there. Cool. Um, for, for people that don't like, not that many people have like an inside view into what the Canadian, like high performance program is right now. Of course it doesn't have its own facility. You can kind of contrast that with kind of our two prime athletes right now living in in the same city. So things kind of balance out. But could you give a bit of contrast as to like what what the the infrastructure looks like for Canadian athletes at the moment compared to uh, what the the American situation is? Yeah, I mean, even I think I think beyond the training center here, like even before the training center existed, there sort of were these pockets of. I guess like hubs of strong competitive climbing communities. Um, I mean, I feel like we have those in Canada a little bit too, um, just in sort of the major cities, you know, that we have those Montreal and Toronto and probably Calgary and Vancouver. Um, But I, I mean, I think that is the case because uh, sort of once you get a psych rolling and you have, people around to be motivated by and inspired by it's a lot easier to really like put your head down and get into training and and get better if you're just surrounded by people that are more motivated than you and stronger than you like it really kicks your ass and (laughs) trying a lot harder and, and getting better faster um and then so i think here now with the training center it's sort of just a really heightened enhanced version of that everybody you know you walk into the gym on any given day and nathaniel and kyra are both there both of them are obviously going to the Olympics. And even though, like for me personally, even though I'm not going to the Olympics, I get to train with somebody every single day who is. And so just even being able to ride that psych, and I mean, hopefully it's sort of a two-way street, can help keep her motivated and her psyched on training and going to the Olympics and, and sort of keep pushing her. But then also she is able to inspire me every day to be trying harder and, and remember that one day we will be working for something again, <laughs> even if it's not the Olympics or even if it's not anytime soon. Um, so that's been really, really good. And they have, you know, coaches and a physio and, and somebody around at all times to be with them like that. And um, I mean, I guess in Canada, we just don't have that yeah. in any capacity. Like there's not, we don't have a. It's kind of like, like, it's kind of by correspondence almost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I do think, I do think here though that, um, for example, there's four girls who are between the ages of, I think probably 17 and 22. So Chloe Cosgoy, Sienna Kopp, Taya Wolf, and Quinn Mason, um, all who are like national level athletes here in the U S. Um, and they just all decided that they were going to, um, rent a house in Salt Lake and do whatever online school they're doing all here all together. So the four of them moved into a house around the same time I did. Um, and they've just been here ever since living here and training. That's sick. Um, but they were just able to like, like that wasn't a USA climbing thing that wasn't mandated by anybody. They just decided that that would, was what was going to be best for them and picked up and moved here. And now um, it's really great having them in there. Cause it's like, 
usually more girls than guys in that training center, which is rare. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's been cool to see too, but I feel like even just, even just having those relationships with people in Canada where you would be like, take a group of friends and be like, we're going to move to Montreal together for six months just to train and just to get better and just to use these facilities. Like, I feel like things like that even happen a lot less yeah. in Canada. Just, I mean, partially because I think there's maybe less opportunities in terms of climbing, but like, I mean, that wasn't a USA climbing thing. These girls are just psyched and they knew that they would keep each other psyched if they lived in the same place. So they just did it. Right. Um, if there was like something you could take, like, let's say you had to move back to Canada right now. Is there something that you would take from your experience in the training center and just be like, I have to emulate this here? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I mean, I hadn't really, there's not that many good spray walls in Canada. And maybe not where you're walls. from, but we have like a dope. We got like, we're all yeah, about we spray walls in Toronto. Like, maybe. Vancouver, there's not really, that doesn't. And that's not a thing, but yeah. like the, at the training center, like there's a mass, it's like every wall is mass. There's a huge, yeah. 40, it's like, it's not 30, like a wall. It's like a ton of wall. Yeah. 40, 30, 20, 50 all yeah. in a row and then all totally filled in. And I mean, I think even in terms of just purely power, just being able to be on that wall has been like pretty amazing. So I think, I don't know if I would try to build one in a backyard. I don't know how I could <laughs> transport that from, from Salt Lake to um to Vancouver but I think I also maybe wasn't doing it because I am not very I was not very good at it so I think trying to force myself to do things that I don't like more than I already was doing um would be a big one because I I think in the training center like if there's an act an activity or an exercise that I don't like doing, but everybody else is doing it, then you're like, Oh, I can like, okay, I guess I should probably do whatever these people, you know, cause it's good for me. Um, so I think sort of having an array of training exercises, whether it's spray wall or doing comp blocks or we've gotten into bench pressing or whatever it is here that I hadn't done at home. It's been cool to do new things, um, that I wouldn't have done, um, just being sort of motivated by whoever else is doing them in there. You, you've accidentally touched a nerve where I'm like, I'm like a spray wall evangelist. And the, the struggle with spray walls is that the people that like know how to use them, love them, but it's not a very like friendly. Um, it's not, it's not very friendly for the public. It's like super intimidating. There's no guidance. It's, it's really hard to use if you don't have like unreal psych, um, and that's like, that's something that is, has always been tough. Have you found that it's like, what, what is it that's making it easier on you? Is it just having like other people using it as well? Or have you kind of needed a bit of like guidance of like, you know, people giving you problems? Pe like, have you needed kind of like a lot? I don't want to say supervision because you're an adult, but like, ha have you needed that, <laughs> that kind yeah, of like I somebody mean, pointing stuff out for you? What makes it easier? Yeah, I definitely having like a crew obviously makes it easier because then you can be like, I have a concept and if it doesn't work, then you kind of just go, Haha, that was stupid and then like move on. <laughs> um, but then you also get some pretty cool boulders. So it's cool to have that atmosphere in there. Um, the other thing that's been good is to actually see, to have committed to it and have been doing it for however many months now, almost seven, um, and to actually be seeing like improvements has been motivating recently. Um, I think like the first day I was ever in the training center, Kyra showed me this pinch boulder and she has like a four or five pinch boulders on the 50 degree. And she showed me like the easy one. Like she was <laughs> like, Oh, this one's the easy one. And I think I could do like one of the moves on yeah. it at the time. And then I just did it like nice. last week. It was her easy. I sent her easy. <laughs> pinch boulder after working on it for seven months so i guess um, that's what it takes to go to the olympics you know is those 50 degree pinch problems pinch <laughs> um, um, so yeah so i think like one having the crew obviously is crucial the crew is crucial <laughs> anyway um <laughs> but also being able to see progress like i mean i think that's motivating in any sport right. aspect whether it's weightlifting or whatever but i think being able to see that on a spray wall is something i hadn't really thought about before 
because I think even when I spray walled, I'd always do new boulders. Like we'd make up a new one. But Kyra has always been meticulous about like, this is my 40 degree pinch boulder. And like, if I'm having a good day, I can do it. And if I'm having a bad day, I can't do it. Or she'll have these boulders that she like tries every session. And then she's only done them twice or something. Right. Like they're that hard that she can almost never do them unless she's having a good day and then she does it. Um, and so I haven't had that much experience like doing the same spray bowler over and over and over and over and over and over until you either do it or you get bored, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But, um, but so that's been, been cool to be able to like see that process more in depth. Cause I have, I mean, I visited her in Minnesota when she was climbing at the A, which is her old spray wall there. Um, so I had seen glimpses of it, glimpses of it, but being here and training with her full time, it's like cool to be a part of it and see how that plays out for her. Right. Okay. I want to like the, the, the couple Olympians that you're training with, they have a, a very clear, uh, time window for what they're training for. They, they know what the task is going to be. What about everybody else that you're training with in that building? Like, what are they, are they fairly certain that they want to do world cups if, if they're allowed to, or is everybody just there like getting strong, not really knowing what it's about. Like what's, what's everybody looking forward to right now? I mean, so like you sort of touched on earlier, Canada has canceled all comps for the season. The U S has not. Mm -hmm. Um, so they still like, they have a selection event coming up. The people that are still in youth have regionals coming up. Um, and then nationals, like everything is scheduled to happen, especially these regional events, like where they can keep numbers low. And it sounds like they might do like a, circulating ISO system right. where not everybody's in ISO at the same time or whatever it's going to look like. Um, so things are going forward here. So whether it's your youth comps or it's, they're going to have a big selection camp um, or even just mock comps that they're running here. Like they run, they run a couple like more serious mock comps where they have like judges and things. And um, so uh, yeah, I guess so things are happening here still right so that's what people are motivated for whatever it is whatever that event um looks like they also did this um pretty cool thing actually through the app kaya um for all the youth athletes they set boulders at local gyms that were like comp boulders and then they had all the kids go in and they had to film themselves climbing the boulders and then upload them to the app and then they had judges look at all the videos on the app and then like confirm whether it was a send or not and then that's how you're ranked in your region was through these like virtual events. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I like, I, it's been cool seeing them try and innovate around the thing. I, you know, everybody stands in a different position when it comes to like, if stuff should be canceled for COVID or not. I personally am on the side of like, yeah, I'd just rather not do a regionals or a divisionals or whatever. I think like one thing I'm curious to see, and you know, neither of us have answers for this, but I feel like there will be, a, a lot of attrition in Canada when comps do come back. I think you will just see a lot of faces don't return, which is really sad. Um, but in the States, maybe that won't be an issue. I personally think yeah, that I mean, the health I, crisis I think, isn't worth it, but I mean, I think personally, like they didn't do that for the open categories. I think they're sort of just like whatever, but for the kids, like, I mean, I think even just having a virtual comp, like that was a huge deal for them mm -hmm. just to have anything to be like, feel connected to their climbing friends, feel like the climbing they were doing was beneficial. Um, and I mean, like, it's been a hard year for everybody, but I think mental health wise for kids, like it's kind of been especially rugged, just like socially and, act and being able to be active like they were before and training even. Um, so I think personally, the fact that USA climbing was trying to do anything even if it was this weird online format that might not have been foolproof, like trying to keep the kids engaged in order to maintain that retention you're talking about when right. everything comes back to normal. I think, um, I don't know. I think, I mean, I think it'd be hard in Canada. It's hard in the U S too, obviously, because gyms are closed at different times and rates because of different state policies. But, um, I think them trying to engage the, especially the youth athletes any way they could was really, um, really cool to see mm -hmm. trying to do do whatever they can to make uh 
make sure kids are still psyched on climbing and yeah. and, uh, and staying in it. On that thread of uncertainty, like I don't want to, you know, like Wikipedia tells me that you're Kyra Condi's best friend, so I don't want to abuse that. Um, but, you know, between Nathaniel and Kyra, there's, well, actually just like just before we started recording this, uh, there was a, a an Olympic press conference where the, the IOC president was like reiterating, like we're committed to making the Olympics happen. We're not talking about whether it will happen. We're talking about how it's going to happen. So, that's reassuring, but he's only making that statement because there's been all this like whirlwind discussion about like, you know, is it going to be possible? Have you heard that discussion start to like distribute around the people you train with? Is it something that you feel like those athletes are having to think about at all? I mean, I think obviously they're nervous. I think Kyra specifically maybe is more nervous than it'll be canceled now that there was all that talk about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, she, I think, I mean, Kyra specifically, she got an email or some sort of notice from the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee um, that said, there are rumors going around of the Olympics being canceled. We have no reason to believe they're true. Any information on the cancellation should come from us directly. And she hadn't even heard the rumors that they were going to be canceled. <laughs> so she was like, oh, weird. Um, but... I think since sort of hearing that there were rumors, she's probably more nervous that they're going to be canceled. But yeah. um, I mean, I think everybody's sort of in the state of mind of like, you got to just be believing it's going to happen until you're told otherwise. Cause, um, cause if you don't, you're just going to lose the training psych. Yeah. Real quick. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of what I was, was curious about, but yeah. Okay. Um, I want to, I want to talk now a bit about, um, about yourself and kind of the, um, the personality and like the brand that you've built up around yourself and, and it like, man, the number of like gripped articles where it's like 20 hilarious Alice invest videos is super funny. I think that's very cool. And there's not that many, I don't know how often that happens for any other climbers where it's just like, here's a bunch of videos of this one particular person. That's a very interesting strong suit that you've built up. That's pretty cool. Um, but I'm curious about what your sponsors um, like what your, what your relationship is with your sponsors in terms of like, what are they expecting from you? Are they, um, you know, what, what value do you give to your sponsors? Is it in your outdoor climbing and, and knocking things out like Terminator or is it being on the comp circuit or is it being a presence on social media, whatever that is? Yeah, I think I want, I feel really lucky to have felt like the sponsors I've worked with, um, have just been supporting me because of who I am and because of that brand, whether that's what I'm climbing outside or what I'm doing in competitions or like falling on my head and either like any of those things, like not everybody can do it. You know, I think those all represent different aspects of, of me as a, as a person and as a climber, both. Um, I think, I think I, have sort of a the humor outlet to balance out the sort of intense parts of my personality sort of the competitiveness and um I tend to be pretty hard on myself in terms of training and um and achieving the things that I want to and so I think the the humor and sort of those types of videos really balance that out for me and and um sort of rationalize it as me being a more well-rounded person and my entire value not being whether or not I'm standing on a podium or on top of a boulder, like it, it sort of, um, I guess enhances the concept that I also have value just for being who I am, not yeah. for what the number is on the grade or for what the podium is or whatever. Um, and I think I've been lucky so far to work with sponsors that, um, that believe that and appreciate that, uh, that aspect of, of who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, uh, like, what would you say the, the, you know, I, I understand that the social media stuff is, is a, is a really big part of just like getting brands out there and that's really important. Um, but from, from the climbing career side, uh, your training right now seems to be pretty dominated by like competitive mode of, of training, but do you feel like for, for who you are as a competitor, is that a stronger brand position as a climber than, the reputation you can build outside? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting question. I think, I think as far as like you sort of are calling it branding, as far as calling as branding as a, 
athlete from a sponsorship perspective. Um, I mean, I just feel like authenticity is like the biggest factor there. Like if you're an athlete who's like really motivated by competition climbing and you're like, that's where your drive lies, then sort of centering your brand when you reach out to sponsors as being a competitive athlete and as like your con- the content you put out being like around comp climbing, then I think that's the way to go. Cause it's just who it's authentic to who you are as a person. Like it's a lot harder to, to force it once you're in it, if it's not where your passion really is. Um, I mean, I think it obviously also depends on the brand you're working with. Some brands are like never going to post a comp video. Like it just doesn't fit right. with who they are. And, and you know, some, some brands are diehard outdoor climbing companies and, and that's the content and the people they're looking to work with. Um, so, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of factors obviously there, but um, I think as an athlete focusing on being authentic to who you are um, really goes a long way. Right. Um, can you give some insight into uh, where you're at as a climber? And maybe I don't, I'm obviously not going to ask about money. Let's use yourself and some of the other people you train with who are who are also sponsored. How much of your your lifestyle is supported by the income you get from the sponsor relationships you have? Like, are there still athletes you're training with kind of at your level, World Cup level competitors um, who are dependent on you know, maybe family financials or their own job to, to support their climbing, or are they pretty much covering at least the basics, uh, through their sponsorship? Where's, where's that at right now? It's an interesting question. I think it depends on the country actually. Um, like a lot of the European countries are. Yeah. They're in kind of a different realm. Yeah. In the military. Yeah. Like that's what climbing is under. So they're all funded by, um, by their country. Yeah. Um, and then other countries too, like, I mean, even in the U S some, like a bunch of the top athletes get funding for traveling for comps and even for, um, things at home as well. Um, so that is stuff that like sponsors, sponsors don't have to cover. It's a new thing for the U S I think it was really cool to see that happen for them last year where they were fully funded and didn't have to pay for flights or accommodation or whatever that is. Um, I mean, and hopefully Canada will get there. And then if you're, a national level athlete, you'll have to worry about being able to pay for like food and living in Canada, but won't have to worry about the extra expense of, um, traveling and being in other countries for, for comps and things. Right. Um, I mean, I think if you look at like the top tier athletes across the world, whether it's through sponsorships or through their countries, um, most of them probably wouldn't have to have a real job. Some of them do because it's like what they're passionate about and um, and they just they want to have that different aspect of their life. But I think for the most part, some way or another, most athletes don't. Most of the top World Cup level athletes wouldn't have to have a, a real full time job. Right. Yeah. OK. So are, are, do you find like you're in a, do you feel comfortable with the situation that you're in right now where you feel like like do you feel like you're falling behind in any kind of regard financially or in terms of your own just life with the scenario that you have right now? Or do you feel like basically secure financially that at least for now you're covering the cot like you're covering the rent, you're covering food, all that kind yeah, of stuff? I mean, it's I, I mean, it, it's I had like. I just didn't spend money last year that I thought I was going sure, to yeah. be like, I, you know, the, my thing that I'm saving up for all the time that I need to make sure I have enough money for is to be able to like fly to world cups and right. just, even, just be able to actually Get compete there. to yeah. do what I'm training to do. Um, make sure I have enough money to be able to do that. Um, and I mean, I think, yeah, I think that's the biggest factor this year is I just didn't spend it last year. You know, yeah. like you're preparing to go to, five different countries in a year and spend a week or two in each place. And then you don't have to spend any of that. Like, I think that's a big factor, at least personally for me, for not feeling like I'm in a tough situation right now during the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, let's, let's kind of like, uh, uh, wrap up just talking about the next couple of years. So at this point, it seems like the Olympics will probably be a, or sorry, climbing will be a like consistent Olympic sport next time around we're not gonna have to worry about speed or anything like that uh do you feel confident kind of 
in your training, are you ready to restart another four year? I guess it's not even four years. I guess it's like three years, basically, at this point. Are you kind of on that path of like, you know, let's do it again. Let's uh, let's go after this thing with just lead and bouldering or I, I, I don't you're going to be what, 20 nine or 20 yeah, 28 or 29 I, yeah. in the 2024 olympics yeah. um like i mean that's not stretching it there's going to be a bunch of athletes at that age or older at the next one um but when you see all the all the young people that come up and there's going to be you know three seasons worth of new athletes that appear on the scene like all the lilianas and chai huns and all that kind of stuff um it's still i'm guessing a target of yours right for sure yeah yeah. So how do you how do you spend the next three years? Like what is uh, like what is that look? Assuming World Cups, it might be weird this year, but next year World Cups are back for twenty twenty two, like on a regular schedule. Like is that kind of what the assumption is? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely it's like a hard thing to try to balance. Yeah. D- between like, like like you said, there's other aspects of climbing that I can also focus on, namely like climbing outside. Yeah. Um. So not worth the time, but like whatever, if you like that kind of thing. Balance that, especially. I mean, now that, like we've said a bunch of times, um, now that comps are canceled in Canada, um, I mean, pr- first of all, that probably means I don't have, I won't have to be back in Canada really much at all, which is helpful because obviously there's quarantines and procedures that I would have to go through to be able to be back in Canada to compete. Yeah. Um. So in a way that's nice because it means I can just be here and be focusing on training even more consistently than I was before. Um, But it also, I mean, it's sort of like we were talking about with just maintaining the psych. Like it's also just hard to know where to dedicate that energy at the moment. Like is Canada, if World Cups go forward, is Canada even going to send athletes like so you don't you haven't possible. heard no. yet if that's even a thing if if Canada well, I, don't, nobody, I don't think anybody knows like I don't think it's off the table but it's definitely not securely on the table either like gotcha. if there was World Cup I it sounds like if there's travel restrictions it might just be a no go right um, which would be a little annoying because I think the first two World Cups would be here <laughs> so if I was yeah. just living here and wasn't able to compete that would be a little bit sad but um but uh so yeah so I mean and on that no it is hard to know like do i just full flip and start focusing on trying to climb a really hard boulder and maybe dedicate time to because i haven't really done that at all like had a you know a multi-month project that you're setting simulators for in the gym or like really focusing on trying to train for specific moves on a specific boulder um and that's definitely something that i would like to do while I feel because I mean I right now I feel stronger than I ever have in my life so it'd be cool to be able to dedicate that towards a boulder like that because that's always something I've wanted to do um but at the same time competitions has always been my priority and so if there is a chance that I'll be able to compete at world cups this year like that would be a cool thing to train for as well so I mean I think it's hard this specific year to think about how that's all going to shake out um and when like, I mean, I think I'm I'm going to be focused on competitions and training because I do want to try to qualify for the next cycle of Olympics when we kick speed out of the combined format. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it'll just be a matter of, of um, how much I'm doing that and how much I'm climbing outside and, and what that balance will look like. And I think this year it'll depend on the state of the world, you know. Yeah. I feel that. Um, not like I hate talking about outdoor climbing on this podcast because it's like a like you know the whole like meme is that this is you know it's plastic weekly right, but it's also not a weekly podcast, so fuck it. It's not no, none, it's of, none of it's for real. It's all garbage. <laughs> but like, what uh, is there anything that's got you psyched in in Utah? Like, are you um, are there projects where if if Canada just told you, hey, we're not sending you to any comps this year, like, are there things you're ready to jump on? Like, what what would uh, not that uh, I'm interested, but maybe other people might, maybe you know, other people maybe are. other people. Um, it would be cool to send V14. And there's yeah. a couple around here that are, feel approachable, at least. Um, I mean, it's cool. I haven't, like, I've mostly only bouldered outside in Squamish until I moved here. And, I'm, right. and Squamish is, like, notorious for not having holds. Yeah. So for a gym rat like me, who, like, is just grabbing grips all day to go to Squamish and for people to be like, mm, it's this tiny little crystal that you stand on and you have to just squeeze the whole yeah, boulder. Yeah. Like it's not, <laughs> I don't vibe with that super yeah. well. So, um, 
I hadn't like climbed on sandstone really until I moved here. So it's just like, there's all these different rock types here. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know normal people and normal climbers are used to there being different rock types. But Apparently rock they types. exist. I have no idea. I had no idea. So I moved here and I was, you know, you can go to Little Cottonwood and there's granite and then there's quartzite up in Ogden and Joe's is all sand. Like there's just all these different rock types everywhere. So it's been mostly just getting acquainted with new styles of climbing. Like, I don't know if there's necessarily a project I'm super dead set on at the moment, but it's more just a matter of getting to experience and, and climb on different types of rock. Are you roping up outside at all? Not yet. (laughs) Okay. Cool. I will. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, as long as you sound convinced, then sure. In the summer, in uh, we went to Maple Canyon, which is again a different type of rock. It is conglomerate, so it's just like big, like Gross. actual stones, just like it's right. The clo- in the- it's like the closest thing to like indoor climbing that you can get outside. It is. It is. It was, I yeah, which is also wild. So that's just yet again another instance of like just being completely boggled by a new kind of rock formation. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't know. It'll, it'll be it's I it's just interesting to see nothing, you know. I think this has been a massive time of uncertainty and it goes through waves of feeling like I can really focus on climbing and then waves of like climbing doesn't matter, everything else in the world is bad and I can't focus on training <laughs> and so it sort of is an ebb and flow in that sense as well. Um as well as trying to have like a goal during a pandemic. It's all, you know, I think it really has put things in perspective and made me feel really lucky to be able to focus on climbing and focus on goals and have that be my, um, sort of what I'm deliberating right now is like what goal I'm working on. Like I really, it really has put it in perspective for me and really made me feel very lucky to be able to, to live the life that I do where I do right now. And, and, uh, and for that to be what I'm able to focus on. Yeah. No kidding. No kidding. Uh, well, hopefully some Salt Lake City World Cups happen and hopefully you can be the Canadian delegation there. I doubt it'll happen. I was trying to be in Salt Lake last year and of course that all fell apart. Um, but if not this season, maybe next season I'll get to actually see you uh, out there and, and I'm going to break into the training center for sure because you know, I have to check that place <laughs> out. But yeah, I will do a gym tour. We'll we'll both go and and not climb some real rocks and yeah. uh, and, and I mean and it's like like I said I mean even for the Olympics like what Kyra and I talk about all the time is it's like if for example if World Cups didn't happen if the Olympics if whatever happened like there are bigger things in the world like it would be disappointing it would probably be pretty devastating if the Olympics didn't happen for Kyra for me too honestly just to um see that for her would be largely disappointing but I mean we're at this point in the world where it's like if sports can't happen, it sucks, but it's not, it's not the pressing, pressing issue of the time. So 2020 you know, was a very introspective year, I think for everybody. Yeah. We'll get back <laughs> to pumps eventually. We'll get back to climbing. It's only a matter of, of when, and if it's not this year, then uh, there's very obviously more important things to focus on. So, yeah. All right. Let's leave it at that. Allison Vest, the reigning Canadian champion in all disciplines, except for speed. And not- she, she doesn't care about that one. So it doesn't matter. Nope. Uh, and of course, <laughs> strong outdoor climber whenever she decides to just spend five minutes outside she'll she'll send something cool uh i really appreciate you making the time after an early training morning so it was great to see you again yeah thanks for having me um thank you very much for watching uh this episode of plastic weekly of course if you want to support the podcast or get stickers or or be on one of these shows you can always uh, make a donation at the patreon come talk about what we're all talking about uh gym culture and competitive climbing in the plastic weekly discord at the link below and of course, make sure you like and subscribe and uh, and follow Allison everywhere she is, especially on Instagram or just uh, go go to gripped.com and see whatever compilation article they put together recently. Anyway, that's it for this episode. Thanks so much, Allison. And we'll see you in Thank the you. next one.